And now you are officially at the halfway mark. How do you feel? Has the material so far been helpful? We'd love to hear your feedback and thoughts. I know there have been a few technical spelling and spoken errors at this point, but hopefully not so much that it distracted you. Don't forget that liking, commenting on, and sharing our YouTube videos help them rank higher in the YouTube SEO searches. If you like the work done so far, please help others find the material too. It's okay to go back and comment on past modules if you feel inclined to do so, and share the links on your school and social media pages. We greatly appreciate your support. Okay, so now we're going into the enteric rods. This is a large module, so strap in. Some of the concepts will be similar to the gastritis causing diseases from the last module, and a few of these will only be touched upon as they're relatively rare on testing. Even when treating patients in the hospital, we often use empiric antibiotic treatment for certain conditions. We're not always concerned about the particular bacteria causing the disease, and many are polymicrobial anyway. We also see a few more Ella and non-Ella sisters, which makes four if we include Legion Ella from the last module. The next module will cover the others classified as the Ella sisters. Some of the Enterobacteraceae family, also known as enteric rods or coliform bacteria, are normal flora in the human gastrointestinal tract. Even then, when they overgrow, they can cause harmful sequelae. Salmonella happens to be in the news every few years due to localized outbreaks of food poisoning or gastritis symptoms. However, typhoid fever is a more interesting disease caused by this bacteria. Typhoid fever is very contagious and associated with soiled water and foods that come into contact with that water. It is not seen in industrialized nations very often, but be aware if patients are traveling to endemic areas. Common routines of infection can include foreign street vendors, undercooked meats, and vegetables washed with infected water. Remember with salmonella, it's often coming out of both ends. Pneumonia is extremely rare and hardly worth mentioning. Osteomyelitis is also rare too. However, those with hemoglobinopathies such as sickle cell seem to have an increased risk for this disease. Hematogenous spread is suspected, though the mechanism's not really clear. E. coli is known as a model organism, which means it has been studied extensively over the years and has helped to explain many biologic properties. There are many subspecies of Escherichia, but we will focus on the few with human pathologic concerns. It is a common pathogen found in and on humans and animals, making it a common microbe to come into contact with. It is also normal flora in many of our guts, but certain species and subspecies have been identified as dangerous. The most important by far is O157H7, or enterohemorrhagic E. coli. If medical students are expected to remember the number designated to a bug, it must have made a great impact in medicine. Of course, with a name that has hemorrhagic in it, we know this will cause a bloody diarrhea. However, this can sometimes progress to severe systemic infections with renal failure, known as HUS. Hemolytic uremic syndrome, being a syndrome and not a disease, can involve loss of platelets, anemia, renal failure, and more. The second most prominent for testing purposes is usually enterotoxigenic E. coli. This version doesn't have the same virulence factors as its hemorrhagic cousin and causes a milder, watery gastritis. As it is often seen from patients that travel to Mexico and other endemic regions, it is also known as traveler's diarrhea. The next few are more gunner topics than anything, due to their rare and specialized occurrences or general and nonspecific presentations. Be aware that there are other species, which are classified by their virulence factors, but we'll not go into too much detail here. Shingalosis is a major cause of diarrhea in the US. Like many pathogenic enteritis causes, this microbe is easily transferred in water and is highly contagious. The evolutionary pressures that seem to make waterborne diseases so contagious is an interesting topic of much debate. Like E. coli, Shigella has a similar toxin that can also cause HUS. This bug can also cause reactive arthritis, which we saw with Campylobacter in the previous module. These are the more common diseases associated with this bug on testing. In some rare instances, you may see a pseudomembranous colitis as well, but this is much less common in Shigella than in C. diff and only really associated with the Shigella flexineri species. Toxic encephalopathy is also incredibly rare. It strikes as an odd presentation, considering the bacteria is usually wreaking havoc in the guts. Mostly, concentrate on the first two diseases when thinking about this microbe. Anyone that is aware of the bacteria Yersinia is likely to first associate it with the plague. But this is a fairly uncommon presenting feature in the modern era, and is a less common species within Yersinia. 
Y. intercolytica is much more common and associated with typical GI symptoms. This can also fall into the watery diarrhea category, which is often used academically to separate from bugs that produce hemorrhagic colitis. This is another that can cause reactive arthritis as well. The numerous enteric and genital urinary bugs that can cause this type of arthritis leads many to believe that causes are unique inflammatory or autoimmune types of reactions. The process is still not well understood. Though rare, if you see a question regarding pseudoappendicitis, this is nearly pathognomonic for Y. enterocolitica as well. In the clinic, you may still want to consider this if presenting with the typical appendicitis signs and symptoms. Y. pestis is the cause of the infamous plague epidemic. It is spread by fleas on rats and was thought to travel via rodent stowaways on ship voyages. There are actually two main types of plague, bubonic being the one of notoriety, this causes buboes, or large lymph nodes, which can be as large as a chicken's egg. Pneumatic plague, on the other hand, is mostly limited to respiratory symptoms similar to pneumonia. It develops quickly and can lead to hemoptysis as well. Klebsiella is a bug of various locations and pathologies. Some species like the lungs, others like the genital region. Since it is also found as normal flora on the human body and in the soil, it can be a fairly common pathogen to be concerned about. It can cause UTI, though gram-positive bugs or E. coli are much more common. It also causes granuloma inguinale, which should be separated from other genital infections. It is also a painless lesion, which easily separates it from the painful H. ducreae. K. pneumo, though less common than strep pneumo, is still a concern for pneumonia presentations. It is a common nosocomial infection as well, and is a particular concern for hospital-associated pneumonias. Although some resources in the past have used lung and brain abscesses as testing fodder, these are exceedingly rare. The above-mentioned microbes are very common, and both learners and physicians need to be thoroughly aware of these. But we also have this miscellaneous bunch to review quickly. They are somewhat moderate in level of importance. Luckily, they are almost all a concern for the same disease, UTI. As discussed with past UTI-causing bacteria, those microbes found on the GIT are in close proximity to the urogenital tract. Of this first category, Proteus is the most commonly tested on. The aspects that separate these out from others on this page are the kidney stones that can be formed. The mechanism of action will be discussed in the third tier. Enterobacter and Serratia really could have been grouped together for easy memory. Again, we see the UTI pathogenesis, but also they can both cause pneumonia. It's a bit odd for enteric bugs to end up in the lungs. Bacteroides is the other ABC anaerobe that we've been waiting for to finish off the mnemonic. Which were the A and C in the mnemonic? This bug can also cause abscesses and other GI infections. Citrobacter has a rare presentation of meningitis, along with UTI symptoms that would be expected. Bacteremia is a concern with all enteric bugs, which may help to explain their varied anatomic locations of concern. This last page was pretty low yield in general. Besides knowing that anything enteric may cause UTI, the other aspects are rarely tested on. Clinically, these are much more rare than the others in this module, but you'll still run into them occasionally in the hospital or in a specialist setting. For more information, also read the related chapter for this module within the course materials, or pick up a medical micro or infectious disease book at your local library. As usual, we'll continue on with the signs and symptoms of these disease states in the next tier. Are you an educator or a student with an interest in creating educational content? Would you like some tips and tricks to improve on the educational material you're working on? Please contact us via the website contact form or social media to inquire about free instructional design advice. We're also open to discussing hosting your material and working together to build a platform for the future of medical education.